Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm truly honored uh, to be host for Elvira Chosevich. He's the president and founder of uh, Everest Medical Instruments. He's here with us to share the, uh, the wealth of information that he has in biomedical uh, devices. And before he starts, I just want to make a short in introduction for, for Elvira. Everyone here, when new people come here to introduce their topics, usually there is this, uh, oh, he graduated from X, Y, and then he's at um, you know, at Institution Z, and he's working on this problem. And here I'll go a little bit different. So Elvira is one of these guys whom probably you will see in, in uh, who you will see in a couple of years in one of these Forbes lists. Uh, his company is doing great. His uh, research instincts are excellent. He's working in, in, the, um, in the medical centers where people should be for projects like these. And uh, Elvira, please try to, to, in, to introduce all these problems. I just have to say for whoever is here, that the presentation is like a ride at Universal Studios. It's just awesome. It's very interesting and captivating. Alvin, Hi. Please. Thank you very much. Um, a few open problems in biome uh, biomedical signal processing. Not a lot of heavy-duty math, just a cursory review of various things. Um, looking at medical diagnostics, clinical instruments, uh, and focus in a couple of different areas, brain monitoring and blood analysis, uh, and uh, breath analysis instruments. I want to make sure to point out the collaborators. This is the effort of a whole lot of people. I'm just one of the, one of the guys on the team here. And a uh, big disclaimer on the bottom for uh, borrowing work without giving explicit credit because so many people contributed to this. And if there are any medical doctors listening to this, um, apology for overestimated clinical claims on this. The basic idea is how do we apply, how do we take the basic science and applied science and things that we know clinically and how do we put them together in, in a way that, that's usable and practical in small medical devices and then move it, to, move it further to uh, consumer devices. So there's a number of different areas in biomedical engineering that I won't talk about and that's all the drugs and biotechnology, biology, biochemistry, all of those things and I'll focus on uh, diagnostic devices, not therapeutic devices. So the idea of the talk today is things we can measure and, and how quickly. Uh, focus on electroencephalography, electrical brain patterns coming from the brain, auditory evoke potentials, sounds played in the ear in response to which uh, electrical patterns are, are developed, pulse oximetry for measuring oxygenation in blood, and hyperspectral imaging for blood analyte detection. So uh, key point on, on this slide is that there's there was a wealth of uh, invention in medical device technologies all the way through the mid-80s. And for a number of reasons, some that have nothing to do with science, but um, a lot that have to do with managed care, th there's not been a number of great inventions uh, since that time. And one of the reasons is that we've stopped transferring basic research in, in, in combining research in mathematics, engineering, and, and medicine putting them into devices, even though in, in parallel we've had a revolution in uh, computer science and hardware and software and the kinds of tools that we can do today. Uh, th computers that, that they used to process uh, ultrasound systems you know, needed, you know, was a rack of computers. Now the iPod has a 60 gigabyte drive and more processing capability and compression and decompression than, uh, uh, than an ultrasound machine of 20 years ago. Here's a little bit about Everest Biomedical Instruments Company uh, that, that we run. There's about 20 of us. We're in St. Louis combining the, uh, the clinical part um, here, not inventing any medicine, but just taking things that people have been using for at least 20 years. So no Nobel Prizes for any kind of medical discoveries here. However, uh, quite a bit of uh, digital signal processing and, and algorithm development. So the idea is to automate all the things that Practitioners are doing today, but in very narrow clinical environments, neurologists, uh, uh, people like that, and then pr pushing that into the masses of medical screening. The other part that's necessary for that is making all of that fit into miniaturized hardware because it's just not practical to wheel big machines around in, in, uh, in hospitals anymore. 
Here is an array of devices that we've built so far. Uh, here's the first one, is audio screener. It's an auditory brainstem response machine. Uh, it actually does a couple of things. One, it plays sounds in the ear and then listens for sounds that come out of the ear uh, to determine whether or not babies can hear. The second part is plays sounds in the ear, measures the electrical activity of the brain uh, to see if that works. We built that device uh, and eventually sold the whole product line to uh, uh, Nikolai Biomedical, a big medical device company. We then built a product called CocoPuff that measures CO and CO2 gas, CO and CO2, uh, for measuring bilirubin and jaundice in, in babies. Uh, we then developed, uh, based on, the, on this technology, a device that measures depth of anesthesia for patients who are, uh, for anybody who undergoes surgery and is anesthetized, the question is whether they have too much or not enough uh, anesthesia, and I'll address that a little bit later. And then the new generation is the brain scope uh, generation of, of, uh, of instruments that do neurological assessment at the bedside. Question? Uh, both. What we measure is that the, the breakdown of hemoglobin uh, produces bilirubin, and as byproduct, there's CO gas that's produced. We didn't know that. So we're looking at the CO gas, uh, PPM level CO gas. Actually, we're the first ones to make it in a handheld box, mm. together with a group in California. Uh, just a tiny bit, since I'll talk mostly about neurology applications, I wanted to just five uh, minutes on, on background. Uh, key point, 100 billion cells in the brain. There's a lot of questions about whether these individual neuron firings mean anything. Are we really talking about fields that are set up by neurons? And how does neural communication uh, happen in general? Uh, that's not the topic of the talk today, so I'll, I'll skip <coughs> neural communication. But just suffice it to say that even though the, 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 the actual transmission mechanism is electrochemical, most interesting things that happen in the brain are, are electrical in nature. Uh, there are a number of people that are looking at distribution of oxygen in the brain and which part of the brain is getting more oxygen than some other part. And, and that's interesting, but it has limitations because distribution of oxygen is different from functioning of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, again, electrical transmission. Um, a little bit about the things that we measure in EEG. We're basically just looking at, at most, mostly uh, cortical activity if we look in the traditional EEG frequencies. If we look in higher frequency EEG, what we start picking up is the communication between the thalamus and the cortex, the thalamocortical loops. And if we stimulate any of the senses, like the skin or the ears or the eyes, uh, not the eyes, the skin and the, and the ears, uh, we'll stimulate the brainstem. And then we can correlate the brainstem responses to the sound, which will then propagate and we can measure on the front of the head. Uh, another reason for this chart is to show that um, to indicate the brain, most brain processing is highly symmetrical, front to back, left to right. So there are a lot of things that traditionally EEG is measured from, uh, from the entire brain. Uh, you try to cover as much area as possible. But if you do math cleverly, you can measure just from the front of the head and glean an amazing amount of information about what's happening in the back. Not everything, but for, uh, for the purposes of the products that we're building, there's quite a bit that can be done. Here is uh, one part of the brain, the motor strip that's stripped out of the center. And this just uh, maps uh, one half is the motor strip and the other half is the sensory strip. So how many neurons roughly are connected to what uh, parts of the body? It's kind of an interesting graph. How do we measure things in the brain? Uh, we can, you know, with PET scanners, uh, fMRI scanners, uh, near infrared, uh, spectroscopy and EEG recordings, all different modalities uh, to look at what's happening with the brain. Now, my concern or my interest is how can we build devices that can very quickly in an acute care environment tell us what's happening and I'll show you a number of those. Uh, basic electrical activity, uh, frequency, alpha frequency at about 9 hertz, say 8 to 12 hertz and then higher frequencies at beta. Traditional EEGs uh, neurologists look at them and they determine whether there's a slowing of waves or not. It turns out that most normal brains work very predictably in terms of the, the, uh, the Fourier spectrum of their frequencies. And if there's any major pathology in the brain, it'll be indicated in that shift in frequencies. One nice quote I heard from uh, a friend recently at a presentation is, Measuring the EEG is like listening to the roar of the crowd outside of a football stadium, mm -hmm. which means 
you don't know what each person is saying, but you can tell if there's been a touchdown, <laughs> right? So uh, a lot of people in neuroscience do single cell recording. So they'll, they'll take great care to implant electrodes in exact areas and then do uh, single neuron recordings on, or small field, local field potentials and go through that route. Um, EEG kind of integrates a lot of that information and, and presents it all at once. Here's a traditional EEG machine. Um, this is a little bit of an exaggeration because it's an old EEG machine. But uh, the older the machine, the stronger my point, so I picked one with the paper trail. Uh, normally how you would run an EEG machine, there's a, a technician um, that needs to apply the electrodes. Neurologists don't normally do that. And then there's a neurologist who would review uh, the, the, the record. Normally it's a, you know, a phone book, a, a, you know, Manhattan's phone book size of a printed record that they flip through and look at irregular patterns. And they're, they're very good at what they do, but there's a limited amount of information that can be gleaned by just looking at it. Again, this is an old picture. Now they do effectively the same thing except that they look at it on the screen. Key point, right. it's manually interpreted information. Uh, people at NYU uh, a number of years ago at the Brain Research Lab um, applied this revolutionary thing. I'm sure you heard about it, Fourier transform. Okay. And, uh, and said, OK, so what is, uh, what is here and, and how do we use it? Rather than looking at the time domain, let's see if there's something useful in the frequency domain. And what they found is, um, and, and a number of people uh, looked at this the same way, what they found is that there are certain bands or frequencies that most uh, activity happens in a, in a predictable manner. And I'll show you later how the different ratios of these frequencies actually can tell us some very useful information about what's going on in the brain. Then they derived some simple features absolute power, relative power, symmetry, coherence, front to back, to try to say something about whether, uh, whether the brain is operating the way you would expect it to or not. Then one of the things they did is they showed a color metric scale where they said, all right, if, is there an excess of activity or a deficit of activity from what we would expect in normative data? So you'll see these Easter egg plots uh, in, in the next slide. Here is uh, data from New York, research, uh, New York University Brain Research Labs. It's uh, 1994 data. Uh, the interesting part here is that they ran a number of experiments of, uh, on uh, collecting EEGs from normal people of various age ranges, genders, uh, uh, and, and race, uh, ethnicity, a variety of, of different uh, things that could make the EEG look different, and found that all of those variabilities, while they exist, are relatively small compared to how different the EEG is when there's a pathology. Mm -hmm. And they show their 181 uh, normals, which is a non-trivial project. I think they spent something like $20 million to, to come up with this database. One of the problems is that, uh, first you've got to quantify what normal is. Normal doesn't mean non-patient. Normal means is a person for whom you have a CT scan or an MRI and a neurocognitive exam. And, and a time response test, and, and you've gone through the trouble to quantify to say, yes, this person truly is, medically speaking, functioning normally. And then they collected a, a, a number of other data, on unipolar, bipolar depression, um, alcoholics, uh, cocaine addicts. Clearly, their brains look very, this, this, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> um, one very interesting study they did, I, I don't know all of the details, but they did a study where they looked at babies of uh, mothers who are cocaine addicts and found differences between normal baby EEGs and EEGs of uh, babies that came from cocaine mothers. That's not shown here. Obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, schizophrenia at first break, schizophrenia without medication, and schizophrenia with medication. The interesting part is these three here. These, this is Alzheimer's, the progression to Alzheimer's. GDS stands for a global deterioration scale, which is a measurement of the degree of uh, cognitive impairment. So GDS1 means no cognitive impairment. GDS2 is some cognitive impairment that can't be correlated clinically, but a patient is complaining. Three is what they call mild cognitive impairment, which is the patient is complaining, and when you give them a, a, a four-hour test where you ask them a bunch of questions, you need them to remember things, you can actually document and quantify the degree of memory loss that they have. And then the um, GDS6 through 4 is the, the um, the conversion to Alzheimer's and dementia of vascular and non-vascular type. The interesting part here, this is just EEG. This is a five-minute EEG recording uh, with 20 electrodes. So these are the electrode locations, left and right ear, nose, like that. 
Uh, this data came from a publication from NYU. Uh, what, do, what do different columns represent here? So different columns represent different features that I showed a couple of graphs ago. So here's absolute delta frequency. How much power in milliwatts is in the delta frequency band? Okay. And relative uh, coherence, what's the coherence in the alpha frequency band between the front and the back plotted relative to the electrode, uh, the asymmetry, and then the mean frequency. Where's the mean frequency? So this is just one example uh, of, of a set of features that you can do, look at to differentiate. And um, if, if you look at any medical literature, most papers are published with N of 17 patients and 23 patients and 8 patients. So this is a very large study. As a matter of fact, I believe this is the largest um, neurological database of, of the aging population done at, at NYU at the uh, aging clinic. The person who invented the global deterioration scale is Barry Reisberg, and he was on the team who put this data together. The interesting part here is they track these patients then 10 more years, and they just published this paper to do two things. One, to see how, how accurate were we 10 years ago in, in, in gauging who was at, at what stage, and the so, staging of dementia. The second part was how accurate how much can we predict, mm -hmm. given that we know what happened with this patient, let's look at their EEG 10 years ago and see what our accuracy of prediction is. And, and the numbers are astounding. They're in the 90%, high 80, 90% accuracy. So that means that today, uh, this is an overstated clinical claim, but there's a chance that today you can measure a five minute EEG and with, with you know, high 80 percentage, high 80 percentile accuracy, you can predict where this person is gonna go. Uh, in a number of years based on the electrical patterns of, of the data uh, that you collect. The processing is rather trivial on this. It's no more complicated than filtering and uh, Fourier transforms like that. Deriving which variables out of the thousands of combinations are important, that's the part that, that uh, the people at NYU know how to do. Uh, so now what do you do with this information now that you have this? One of the parts to use it is to look at medical devices, building medical devices that, that can do useful things. The other part is uh, brain-computer interface, uh, controlling things uh, just with your mind, and there's a number of interesting projects on that. And uh, the last part is human-machine interaction and studying uh, uh, data input and then communication back to the machine on this, which has a number of applications. And then other, of course, are a variety of consumer products that one can think of from video games on out. So the first part is uh, pathologies. So uh, this is a chart that, uh, that most doctors see within their first couple of years of medical school, which is the approach to the patient with altered mental status. So once you have a suspicion that this person has something wrong with their head, what do you do with that? So the first thing you're trying to figure out, is this guy normal or abnormal? Is, is something off uh, outside of the limits here? And if so, is it an organic, is it a brain problem, or is it a psychiatric or a functional problem? And uh, I heard at one of the medical conferences, the doctors say, we're trying to assess here, is this a hardware problem, or is it a software problem <laughs> uh, on, on this side? Um, there's some question, especially when you talk to neurologists, on whether you can either tell anything on the psychiatric side of things. Is psychiatric EEG normal? We have a, a significant amount of data to show that it's not. Once you know that it is a brain problem, you try to figure out, is it focal or global? Is it happening on one side of the head, or is it happening everywhere in the head? And that makes a very big difference in terms of triaging patients. Again, remember, what's the purpose of, of, of this first part of the presentation, that what we're doing at Everest is, how do you measure this information and make something useful medical device out of it? And I'll show you some examples. Okay. What's the alarm and ICP stuff? For okay, uh, so the alarm conditions are the conditions that you'd like to identify that, that you don't even want to look at this. If you identify these things, there's something you can do with this patient right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is increased intracranial pressure, meaning that there's either a bleed in this head or a swelling or a concussion such that the brain is, is literally being squeezed out. You know, inside the head is cerebrospinal fluid, blood, and brain. And it's a fixed uh, area. So if anything goes up, something else has to come down. Something has to come out. So in that case, the brain, uh, uh, is literally being pushed out of the head and it compresses the brainstem, which I showed you earlier, which is in the center of the head. When the brainstem gets compressed, we see that with auditory evocation. Active seizure is a condition that, that's obvious. Uh, most people have tonic clonic seizures when they're seizing. A large number of people will not. A significant, clinically significant population, 11, 15 percent, uh, uh, depending on which study you quote, 
have what are called non-convulsive seizures, meaning they're seizing in their head, they have seizure activity, but they're, they're not convulsing. The other part are people who are brought into the emergency room, they're intubated because they have to be paralyzed because uh, they have to put a tube down their throat. And most awake people object terribly uh, to uh, having foreign objects in their throat. Once you know whether you're local or global, you're trying to figure out, is it a stroke of some kind? Is it a mass lesion? Is it some kind of a hematoma? Or is it a number of these toxic metabolic conditions? It turns out the number one brain pathology of all brain pathologies in terms of incidence is the self-inflicted general anesthesia. So 80 million people uh, a year in the U.S. are uh, anesthetized. So it's the, uh, the intentional administration of narcotics and, and hypnotics. So obviously we have a product in this area. Dementia is another one. Uh, concussion is another one uh, that's, that's very prevalent. There are actually more, there are one and a half million concussive and traumatic brain injuries uh, in, in the U.S. that we really just don't know how to, how to deal with and how to diagnose early on. Number of psychiatric conditions like that. So uh, you want to answer all of these questions and you come armed to the bedside with uh, a rubber hammer and tuning forks and a flashlight. Now, not to say that uh, virtually all doctors, especially doctors in the emergency room, they're very good with these tools. And they can do a very good neuro exam with just you know, a rubber hammer and a flashlight, looking at pupils, see if they're contracted, looking at reflexes, looking at a variety of different things. How, fa you know, how fast can you drop one arm or the other arm? All of those things are indicative of what's happening. All of those work great if you're awake and you can talk to the doctor. <laughs> if you're unconscious, they fail. Blood tests are great and useful, but some of the most useful things you want to try to find out is what has this person taken so that they've knocked themselves out so badly? You can't do that test in your lab. You have to send it to a reference lab. Comes back a week later, by which time the patient is dead or home. Uh, try to figure that out. CT scans, uh, excellent tool used every day. Uh, suffer from a couple of problems. One, there's not enough of them. Uh, most small hospitals will have one. And, and they're not available. The second part is they're, they're very expensive. They cost a lot of money and they take a lot of time to do. So is there something in between that we feel, um, even though this is a really narrow gap, that it's actually a huge gap in terms of what can you do to, to uh, diagnose patients with altered mental status? So we built a device called the BrainScope that implements that algorithm. And it talks about you know, is it normal or abnormal, organic or functional, global or lateral, and then actually three alarm conditions, alert we call them, brainstem dysfunction, active seizure, and birth suppression. Birth suppression is a condition where the brain has nearly gone isoelectric. So the electroactivity is wound down to the degree where it's flat for a while, then there's a burst of activity, then it's flat, then there's a burst. And it's an indication of a very deep hypnotic state. Right? For example, if somebody's overdosed, as I'll show you later. Electrode is very simple, like this, single use, applied on the head in one fell swoop. And again, we, don't, we can't measure anything in the back of the head because you can't get in the hair. As soon as you're in the emergency room, this is one big difference between the clinic and the emergency room and the clinic and the operating room. You've got to stay out of the hair. You, know, you, gotta, you go in the hair with one electrode, that's it, no go. So you've got to figure out everything you're going to figure out from the front. So that limited some of the applications, but it still we were able to do most of the things that we wanted to do with that. What's the, problem with the hair? <laughs> What's the problem with the hair? You just can't get into the hair. And you can't get reliable electrode. You're dealing with frontline emergency staff, and they don't have the time or the energy to be trained to do this, and they don't have time in the emergency condition to do that. So, so it's things like positioning, you don't want to move the head and stuff like that? One is you don't want to move the head. Two is you simply can't get in a lot of people's hair. So you can't build a diagnostic device that does that. And people object to having their head shaven. And say, you know what, we did this little test. And while you were out, and <laughs> we changed your hairstyle. <laughs> so what we did from the first chart, we built a device to talk to a large number of doctors, some 400 ED physicians, and a number of neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, neuroradiologists, number of people. What is a useful device to build? So we built one that doesn't do any of these diagnostic features here, but just does the first uh, the, uh, the first level, and we've had great response to this. Now, this is a key, key point in this presentation, is that most of today's medicine is going very deep into diagnostics, trying to figure out with extreme precision very highly valuable diagnostic information. And that's great. That should continue. On the other hand, what we're doing, that, we're doing that at the expense of 
the ability to tell the most obvious things for the hundreds of millions of people that, 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 that show up on a daily basis uh, or on an annual basis. Uh, the latest statistic we have is from 2002, 110 million ED visits, uh, emergency department visits a year, of which 50 million with altered mental status. So 50 million people come to the emergency room with something wrong with their head. And, and uh, I'll illustrate a number of cases of what actually happened with them. So here is uh, one of those 15 million people. <laughs> so uh, as an emergency doctor, when you walk in on a Saturday night, 7 o'clock at night, before you leave tomorrow at 7 o'clock, you will have in some way interacted with each one of these people. And, and wouldn't it be great if you had a little something to just tell you which of the kids who is, you know, out of those six kids there who are complaining of a headache, who has, a men who has meningitis, which of the eight kids that come in with, you know, um, bump on their head, you know, can go home and which have to go for further testing and, and like that. Go ahead. Except for union rules, do you really need a doctor for that with your equipment or can the receptionist do it? No comment. Um, I, um, I, we're not that far along to know that yet, uh, if the device will be used by a doctor or by a nurse. We do know with our prior product, with audio screener, it was used by, um, in the pediatrician's office, it will be used by a, uh, um, an office manager and in an infant um, ward, in the uh, well baby nursery, it would be used by a nurse or by a volunteer. But the device is designed in terms of user interface to be used by a medical professional, mm -hmm. not necessarily a doctor. So uh, here's a quick example of a person that came in, you'll see up there in the history, 59-year-old woman, had a little accident, car accident, complaining of memory problems, came in. This is an electrical, uh, this is that same map that I showed you earlier with the Easter eggs, except with much more resolution and superimposed on a, on a uh, sample CT image. So you'll see here uh, an abnormality in this region. This person was then sent for full-blown MRI and CT scans, and they found out this was not from an accident. There was actually a, a brain tumor uh, that was developing. This is, this is done at bedside in minutes with EEG. This is thousands of dollars and hours and having to go to a piece of equipment uh, to get it done. I'll flip very quickly through a number of cases here. This is what happens in emergency rooms all the time. I've now spent a lot of time in various emergency rooms and with a number of emergency doctors. And they always have the same problem. They're not there to prescribe how many milligrams of what medicine to what guy. It's who is going where. Is this guy going home? Is this guy going to neurologist? Is he going, do I need to scramble and get all the neurosurgeons here? What do I do with this, with this guy? So typical case, I've heard this 100 times from these guys. Uh, three middle-aged men brought in by the police. They were banged up. They were in a fight and drunk. Um, you do something. So what happens with them is the first two, you got to do a blood test, of course, because of alcohol, you have a medical record. Basically, what you do with them, you let them sleep it off. Mm -hmm. Then you let them sleep it off some more. And then, just for completeness sake, because you can't just send them home, you go and blow $1,000 on a CT scan just to make sure that everything is fine. Radiologist or the doctor will look at it and say, it's fine. Guy wakes up, goes home. In the alternative case, with the brain scope, You'd measure these two guys, you'd say, yep, it's not normal, it's organic, and it's global, yep, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> right? So sleep it off and do it again, and the test will come 99% normal. You know, this guy can go home, or wherever he's going. But uh, the key, the key thing is you optimize the doctor's time, and, and you've dealt with all of these medical issues that are very important, cost and length of stay and such. Basically, you show them to the door as soon as you can. The problem is the guy that you least suspected, you know, the youngest guy who was the most talkative, and you thought this guy for sure had no problem. Um, after a while, after he sleeps it off, the uh, nurse notices there's something wrong with the guy. Now you start, you know, putting some equipment on him, give him a little oxygen, do the EKG. Next thing you know, the guy is, uh, guy is in, in, in full arrest. Now you've got a problem. Now it's a whole big emergency. Now, something is definitely terrible happened with this guy. His eyes are rolled over to his side. Now you do a, 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 an exam of the pupils, and you see one is blown completely. Now you know you have a huge thing. Now you're screaming to get this guy into the CT scanner, pushing everybody else out, causing a mess, to find out that you have a subdural hematoma. This is the guy who was hit in the side of his head and was, was uh, you know, uh, developing a hematoma. The big deal there is that what he had is what's called a midline shift, which is what you want to detect. 
As soon as there's a midline shift, now this is an emergency condition. And you're, you're paging neurosurgeons, you're getting the OR ready. And now it's an emergency though. Now you, you've taken the situation that the guy walked in and you were communicating with him. And because you didn't have a chance to look at him and you had no idea what was wrong with him, by the time you got to him, uh, he developed a real emergency. And now you're dealing, on top of this subdural hematoma, you're dealing with an anoxic event, which is actually more dangerous, has a, a, a higher um, uh, morbidity and mortality rate, meaning guy ran out of oxygen and his brain was starved of oxygen for a period of time. So now you're in the ICU, you're committed to this guy for a number of days. Now remember, this is the same guy that came in like the other guys who had some organic lesion, except that this guy came in lateral. Now as soon as you see this, now you know that you've got to do something. So you immediately put this guy in the CAT scanner. You see this right away. You call the surgeon before he starts posturing and moving his eyes and, and, and um, creating an emergency. You drain the hematoma, and the guy's asking for breakfast the next day. What's LOS? Pardon me? You have LOS in the last line. Uh, <laughs> length of stay. <laughs> ICU length of stay. Uh, a typical length of stay in the ICU is about $5,000 a day. The cost of this test is about $50. What's the acceptable error rate in such an application, let's say with brain scope? So suppose we initially think that the guy is just drunk and we just want to send him home. But then a couple of days later, something wrong happens with the guy. So yeah, you couldn't, uh, we're not building a kind of device that you can go to Walmart and get your head tested. This, this device will only work in the hands of a doctor who has all of the other clinical correlating evidence. So he's just using this information as an adjunct incorporating it with all the other information he has. So the doctor will make his judgment however he makes his judgment. These cases are way oversimplified. But what you're giving him is some uh, additional information that he doesn't have right now about the function of the brain. What you're not giving him with CT scans, in this case you'll see this hematoma because it's developed, but three hours ago you wouldn't have seen it. But you will have seen it electrically. Mm -hmm. right? If you're hit on the side of the head right now, on one side of the head, your CT scan will likely be normal. As a matter of fact, a minute after you're shot in the chest and bleed to death and die, your CAT scan will be normal. I bet your EEG won't be normal. <laughs> so so uh, what, what is the resolution you get from purely frontal uh, electrodes? And is it useful for the doctor to look at that raw data in addition to sort of this, the uh, sliders? Yes, resolution is, is uh, gross. It's, it's front, back, okay. um, left, right. That's the basic resolution. That's all we're shooting for. But that's all they need to know. They just need to know, is this electrically the same as this? If it is, OK, fine. I know how to deal with this guy. If there's difference between the two sides on EEG, I got to deal with this guy right now. I, he goes to the front of the line. Right. And, and you get front back even with just the frontal? Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this particular, this is, you didn't actually apply the equipment to that patient, did you? Not this particular patient, but we have a number of patients just like this. <laughs> and this is not new information. We have not invented this. There's, there's easily a, over a thousand publications that talk about these cases. It's just that they were done with big EEG machines, and you have to have that technician and a neurologist and an $80,000 machine and all of these things. And then they follow them in the ICU, and then they looked at outcome of how well can EEG or evoke potentials predict what was going to happen. So what we're I'm presenting here is more of a, a picture story of a typical course. Elvir, can you please show us? I, I think that you brought the, uh, the actual... Yeah, case. the box is here. I'll uh, let it turn on and I'll show you later. I can give you a little bit. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, the anesthesia box is also here and I can show you the, mm -hmm. the electrodes for that. We asked a number of doctors, some 400 of them, what's your biggest headache in terms of what kind of altered mental status? And we expected to hear all these gory stories of a guy who was shot in the head and all of this. They say, a guy who was shot in the head, I know what to do with that guy. That guy is in deep trouble. I don't need your instrument to tell me what to do with that guy. I don't even need a cat, you know. I know, I know that I need to pay attention to that guy. The one person that I need to pay attention, my biggest headache is the headache patient. Because they come in, they complain of a headache. We've all had headaches. So, uh, Here's the typical course. You're, you're your worst enemy when you come in and you complain of a headache because what you do is you're walking in on your own two feet, you give them your name and address, and that immediately puts you at the very back of that room, right? Because you're not brought in on a stretcher bleeding. In the emergency room, that means you're in the back of the room. So you sit in the room, doctor does an exam a number of hours later, you know, typical waiting times are hours. 
um, in, in emergency rooms. Maybe for completion, you'll get a CAT scan. Somebody will look at it, and uh, they'll send you home with a bottle of Tylenol <laughs> at the end of the day. On the other hand, this guy comes in. His EEG record looks 99% normal. You're looking at this guy. It, everything that you're doing and asking him, and you've seen a 1,000 people just like him, you give him discharge instructions, say, go home. If it doesn't get better, come back. You just now reduce the number of patients in here by one in 10 minutes and send them home with the bottle of Tylenol. You get the other guy, record is not quite as normal. You do an exam, you talk to the guy, you do a CAT scan. You find, you ask, you know, so what, you know, this, you know, have you had any problems with your head? He said, yeah, four years ago I had a car accident, bumped my head. And he said, all right, so that makes sense. Same discharge instructions, go home, take some Tylenol, come back if it gets worse. You've dealt with these two guys. The third guy, on the other hand, is the same guy. He was also came in, gave his name and address and phone number. He said here, Doctor did the exam and things didn't look clear. You did a CAT scan, nothing major. While you're, uh, the doctor is in the middle of doing some other procedure, you know, capped and gowned and, and, and uh, in, in a sterile environment, giving, uh, dealing with another patient, the radiologist comes and says, hey, uh, you know uh, John Q uh, that you sent me a couple hours ago? Uh, that doesn't look so good. It looks like he's got, uh, you know, bleed in the side of his head. And he said, who, him? No, I examined him. He was fine. Well, that's exactly the problem. You can examine him and not see it. But what happened is this guy sat and waited and bled into the side of his head for a number of hours. <clears throat> then again, you're scrambling. You know, you look at a you know, big berry aneurysm in the circle of Willis on the bottom of the head. You got a full emergency, so on and so forth. And same story here. If you could just get him out there first and look at that. All right, so I have a couple other cases. I'll skip through them. Here's quickly somebody who was uh, found down the ED doctor's worst nightmare, found down. What does that mean? So they do bloods, heart, everything else. This guy's, nothing's happening. So they're waiting. They, they, they did everything. They say, send him to the uh, ICU. And they're right in the discharge instructions or the transfer instructions to the ICU. Uh, EEG in the AM. Because the neurologist and, and the neurology department usually will work 8 to 5. So tomorrow, they do the EEG, and lo and behold, this guy has been seizing into his head for the last 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So you administer $2.50 of volume. You stop the seizures, but by this time, the guy has been seizing and burning his brain. And there's no question what's going to happen with him. If you can tell that earlier, same $2.50 of volume, you know, guy's walking out and going home. Uh, one more, a drug overdose. Um, so the first thing you want to do is lavage the stomach, right? Because that's your typical procedure. And however, what you don't know is this patient now loses the airway. They stop breathing because they've overdosed themselves so much that the brain went into birth suppression. And when that happens, the airway and the control of, 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 of the airway stops. So now this patient is no longer breathing, but you've just filled their stomach with active carbon, which they've now uh, expelled and aspirated. So now they have you know, all of this stuff in their lungs. Now you've got a real emergency on, on your hand. Same story, different, different thing. If you did it with the, uh, uh, an EEG machine and found birth suppression, you would intubate this patient first because you would know that if they are overdosed so much, they are in birth suppression, then you have a real danger of losing the airway here. And so you would make different clinical decisions. And then you would follow on with the course like that. Go ahead. Does it require so much high tech to know a patient is not breathing? Uh, the problem is, yeah, you'll know that they're not breathing. The problem is you don't know when they're going to lose breathing. Mm. When you see oh, them, they may be breathing. breathing. That's, that's right. Oh, A number of cases we've heard also is somebody is in, in trauma. They broke their leg. They come in, they're sedated. They give them anesthetics or sedatives. And while they're sedated, there's so much pain stimulus that's keeping them half awake. Mm. Right? So uh, you finish with your procedure. You walk away. You let the guy sleep it off and the guy dies. Why did he die? Because the anesthetic is still in his bloodstream. There's no longer the painful stimulus because you fixed whatever was broken. <clears throat> and that, that same remaining level is enough to put him in birth suppression, lose the airway, and stop breathing. So key point here to monitor. Um, how accurate is this? <coughs> Here's um, some um, ROC curves that we ran on 168 patient records and 147 patient records. This is normal versus abnormal. This is what they look like. With that traditional QEG that I told you, we typically get 80s, maybe 80% in 
the nine, uh, you know, uh, high 80s, low 90s. And when we apply a wavelet processing, we get, um, oh, this is still this below. We get in the 90% mm -hmm. and the high 90% here. What is QEEG? QEEG is quantitative EEG. The Fourier star. Pardon me? That's the Fourier star. star. Yeah, basically. Um, this compares with screening head CT scan without contrast, uh, which is 70% accurate. So that's publicly published data. Anesthesia is up a little bit. I told you, here's an anesthesiologist who's monitoring everything about this patient. Everything, blood pressure, heart rate, plethysmograph, uh, pulse oximetry, everything you could possibly imagine, except the one thing that he's actually doing, which is administering a potent anesthetic to, to, to uh, induce hypnosis in his brain. The one thing that's not being measured typically in the, in the uh, anesthesia um, environment is the response of the brain. So uh, a number of companies have products in that arena, and we have as well. Um, here's an example of a patient that woke up and was bucking the tube. One of the things we did is we looked at high frequency EEGs that are up in the several hundred hertz versus the traditional EEG that's down below 40 hertz. And it turns out that, like, uh, like the theory predicts and neurophysiology predicts, that there was really no change to this patient uh, for a number of minutes, for some three minutes, um, in the low frequency domain, whereas in the high frequency, the index jumped up right away. So the idea here, had this patient been paralyzed, for example, because they were also intubated, they wouldn't have been able to buck the tube. They wouldn't have been able to, you know, uh, to do that because with paralysis you can't move. So the idea is how can you do, um, how can you measure this? And EEG is the answer. All right. So so much for blood and gore. Now uh, on to uh, more uh, uh, nicer things. Uh, here's a brain-computer interface. Uh, the idea is you would measure signals from the brain and send it out either to some, you know, screen or a wheelchair or opening something. The idea is how do you bypass, how do you go directly from the brain to some mechanical activator without having to go through the motor uh, um, peripheral nervous system and, and the motor nerves to get some action to happen. And you might want to do that in the patient who is quadriplegic or in the patient who is just sitting in front of a computer doing something. So one excellent way to do it that one of my students worked on is um, electrocorticography. Um, it only has one downside here, and I don't know how Microsoft customers would react to this. <laughs> Craniotomy is required. <laughs> uh, uh, but the nice part about it, the signal-to-noise ratio is excellent because you place an array of some 128 electrodes um, and a few wires coming out of the side of the head. But um, uh, in all seriousness, this is done for finding the locus of a seizure in a patient with intractable seizures. And what, um, you can't really do that very well from the surface of the skull. Uh, but once you put the electrodes on the surface of the brain, then you can localize better where the seizures are. Then they implant other electrodes to find out exactly where the seizure is, and then they go in and either burn it or take it out and, uh, and save this. But this is one brain-computer interface uh, application. Here's another one uh, that we uh, uh, work with at NYU. The idea is that uh, we apply this to a coma patient, and um, uh, we're now running a number of experiments. On this. We have a coma patient who's locked in. So we have reason to believe that he's communicating, but we can't, we can't prove that any, any way. So one of the things we did is we measured at all of the different electrodes, we measured all of the delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma frequencies. And this is a graph that scrolls up like this. And then we build a normative database, and so the, the, the data is self-norming on this. We then asked the, asked the guy to think of uh, uh, his favorite song. And what we see is different parts of the EEG lighting up. And I'll just show you one, um, one of these. So you can see, for example, here that things that lit up where there was excess of EEG activity and the deficit on the other side, it was clearly things are happening on the left side of his brain. And I believe this was, think of moving, think of moving your right arm was the stimulus here. It's obviously there's no movement. So then we repeated these experiments on a number of volunteers, healthy, normal volunteers, and asked them, think of your favorite song, think of moving your right leg, think of doing this without any emotion, and now we're in the process of correlating that. So far the results we see are encouraging, but we're not uh, far enough along on that yet to, to start selling. Just a quick snapshot on the auditory brainstem response. Uh, one of the very nice things about evoked responses is that you get to stimulate the system a number of times. One of the things about EEG is its spontaneous electrical activity of the brain 
of 100 billion neurons. So it's a little hard to tell exactly who is doing what because they're, they're doing it on their own anyway with or without you. With the evoked potentials, what we get to do is play the same signal over and over again. So for auditory evoked responses, we play a sound in the ear and then the, the electrical signal from the cochlea propagate all the way through the various parts of the brain stem into the pons and then uh, this is that same region from the cochlea out uh, through the midbrain regions and out to the cortex. And we see at every major groupings of nerves, we see peaks in the auditory brainstem response waveform. The nice thing about this waveform is it's extremely solid. So it, uh, when, you take, when you look at normative data of a large number of patients, the latency between the first and the fifth peak is uh, a couple of standard deviations out is one millisecond. So it's, it's very steady. So as soon as there's any kind of brainstem dysfunction, you'll see it right away in the spacing of this waveform. Uh, nice thing about this test is that you, you get to apply a number of clever signal processing tricks because you're controlling both the stimulus and, and the reading and, and figuring out how things work. I'll skip through this part. Uh, here's the good, bad, and the ugly of trying to do this in patients who are not in the clinic and where you don't have a doctor. So here's the baby screening. Where of course, you've got the space limitations. You can't do this. You've got acoustic noise. Here's noise from uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And you've got a number of different events that are happening, door closings. And the worst possible thing is water running. Water running just swamps everything. Nice wide band noise. Um, so um, we uh, spent a lot of time characterizing what the noise looks like in this application. And since you know the noise, you, can, you can't use that to, you know, to get the response from random noise. Uh, you yes. You have to control the, the stimulus to get the response if, if you know what it is. You That's know. right. Yeah. So one of the first things what we're trying to do is 40,000 hair cells in the cochlea. What we're trying to do is ping them all at the same time so that we get the strongest signal at all frequencies, right? So you have 20,000 hertz in uh, spanning this 40,000 hair cells. And what you, what you want to do is just play a click into the ear, right? So you get a wideband response. Well, it's only a click electrically. That's the best that any device does right now that's on the market. So you have an electrical click that goes into a speaker that goes to the ear, and here's what happens in the ear. This is recorded in the ear. So you're barely getting uh, this, and at about 4 kilohertz, you're, you're down 30, 40 dB, and then you really get nothing. So an uh, uh, open problem here is how do you first just model this signal? How do you first excite the cochlea such that you get a, a flat response here? So how do you pre-warp your signal ahead of time? so that you, you, you get uh, the cochlea to respond. Here is the uh, one frame of the ABR waveform. This is what one frame looks like. This is what it is averaged. This black, dark black waveform is this waveform here. So this is that ABR. This is the fifth peak. And this is just to give you an order of magnitude. You're dealing with negative 20 dB signal to noise ratio mm. on a good day. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing is just collecting this data. And we've collected a large amount of data. And now we're in the process of, and this is where a lot of the open problems come in, is how do you look through all of this data at the same time? One thing you know about EEG data, it's, look, it's electrical sources immersed in water and fat, right, which is a blob called brain. And, and it's a low-pass filter. And so, so you're getting, this, you know, you're basically getting a distortion of a number of sources in the middle of the head that propagate everywhere through the head. So you can measure this with 256 electrodes, 128 electrodes, or 12 electrodes, or however many you want. H however many you put on there, you know that this is relatively low rank data. And the faster you measure it, it's, it's very easy to get yourself in a situation where you're monitoring a seizure patient for 24 hours. And I mean, pretty quickly, you're, you're in over gigabytes of data. What do you do with this? So this is one open area that perhaps one of you guys will uh, attack one of these days. All right, that's that on the brain. I'll go uh, quickly through the pulse oximetry uh, part. So this is shifting gears altogether, but again, a number of open problems in this area. So now what we're trying to do is we're no longer looking at the brain. We're looking at what's happening with the blood of this patient. What kind of analytes can we read from this blood? So the idea of pulse oximetry, and I'll skip through these parts. The basic idea is, of course, the heart pumps the blood. Blood picks up oxygen uh, in the lungs. Gases don't dissolve well. 
in, 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 in liquids, in blood. So what we, you need is a transport mechanism. The transport mechanism for us is hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a respiratory pigment that picks up four oxygen cells and carries them from the lungs to the cells, picks up then CO2, brings it back, and you do that. So we're trying to measure is, you know, on the tip of your finger, you're trying to measure what's the, how much, uh, uh, what's the percentage of hemoglobin saturation that's reaching the arteries in, uh, in an extremity. So what your body does in, in any kind of an emergency condition or in shock condition, you'll first, first stop the blood flow to the extremities and then pull it in. So if you want to alarm on a condition where this patient is not being oxygenated enough, you do it on the finger or the ear or something like that. It's used a number of different places. One interesting place to use it is in exercise monitoring or in just your regular daily health checkup. Imagine if you had a pulse oximeter that you could wear on your ear or on your watch or somewhere where, where it wouldn't be in your way and you could record this data for five years and then have something alarm when it says, you know what, for the last five years uh, you ran in this band and your, your frame was like this and you fit in these parameters and now all of a sudden something is terribly off and you got to go see somebody. I'll flip through this uh, hemoglobin and how it works, the details of physiology and respiratory. So here is a, a typical pulse oximeter. Basically the way it works is that uh, hemoglobin that's oxygenated has different color than the hemoglobin that's coming back, right? So the deoxygenated hemoglobin. So the way you look at it, you look at red and infrared uh, uh, light and then measure with the detector how much of, 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 of which uh, color goes through. And here's what it looks like on uh, the spectrum, about 660 nanometers red light and about 900 nanometers <coughs> infrared. And as you see, they flip. So you're looking at these two ratios to determine how, what's the oxygenation uh, content. So here's what the waveform of the pulse oximeter would look like on the left. You can see the, that's the heart rate. If you do the FFT of that, there's a nice heart rate here. You can see the, the pulse. On the other hand, here's a patient that's actually moving, living, breathing person. This looks nothing like that. And this FFT looks nothing like that. Where's the heart rate here? So a number of signal processing problems. When you are anesthetized, intubated, paralyzed in a cold operating room, things are very different <laughs> than when you're a living, breathing human being. So even though we've developed very well how to use these medical devices in medical environments, even though they may be on patients with some pathology, the question is, how do you push this out now into general public and, and, and create medical devices for consumers? And before you can do that, you need to solve a number of these problems uh, like this. And uh, a number of them remain unsolved. So a different kind of beer. Uh, but the, the basic idea is you're looking at the, uh, the absorptivity of the different, different kinds of hemoglobin have different absorption rates, so you look at ratio of those. And um, as any fool can plainly see, I had a professor who used to say that, write two boards of stuff. And it's, as any fool can plainly see, it's equal to three. <laughs> We're trying to ox uh, estimate the arterial um, concentration of hemoglobin. And, and the ratio of regular hemoglobin to oxygenated hemoglobin. And from that, also look at how much volume of blood is, is supplying the tissue and then what the heart rate is. Heart rate, of course, very useful uh, signal. What we don't have data on, and, and I don't know if anybody has, I know we don't, uh, is five years worth of data on a patient. I don't think anybody's collected that. And it'd be very interesting to find out what that is. But you can see that in the home application, you could do that. I, I'm a runner, so I wear the polar heart rate monitor. And even that is a lot more sampling than most people get. So two or three or four times a week, I'll get an hour's worth of what my heart rate looked like. And it's actually quite interesting to see. Uh, and to go back and say, here's the same run, same pace, same Saturday morning, four weeks apart. Why is this so different like this? And uh, I would be willing to bet that there's a wealth of useful information. Taking this now from measuring one blood analyte to measuring all blood analytes, a group at, uh, at Yale and the Applied Math Department where I'm at, together with a company called Plainside Systems, uh, developed a number of technologies that use uh, MEMS, uh, uh, microelectronic mechanical system. They, it, they're DLP uh, arrays. 
So much like what's in this projector right now. And I'll show you some of the data. So here's the idea. This is the standard Texas instrument uh, uh, digital mirror array, about uh, 16 micrometer mirrors that you can move at, at high rates. And you can imagine now, you have roughly a million mirrors here. And with the prism, you get to split the light. And you've got a million mirrors. You can flip it a 1,000 times a second. Each of them can tell you a 1,000 wavelengths. And each one you can encode into a 1,000 different levels. So you've got a terabyte of data a second, let's say, uh, flying out of this. Nice thing, very <coughs> low rank data. You're looking at all the same stuff. But how do you crunch through that? So a number of different applications. You can make this a source. You can make it uh, um, so you can have uh, a custom light source so that you're putting light onto your specimen of exactly what is it that you're trying to tune for. So you're not, even, you're not presenting just plain white light and seeing what comes back. Right? So that's one application. The other one is, is to, look, to, to go ahead and do shine all the light and then look at uh, the, on the detector what, what happens. So they ran this. This is what, a snapshot of the early, early device. Uh, the other part is now finding a scene where something interesting is happening. Right? So you're not, you're not actually looking at the whole thing. You're just finding where the, the bulk of your information is and then focusing in, in on that part. One of the tricks they use here is, uh, uh, in, it's, we call it Hadamard spectroscopy. Say you have a scale that's accurate to 10 grams, and you have a number of objects to measure, all of which are less than 10 grams. Can you do that? And this is where the square root of n comes in, right? An improvement in signal-to-noise ratio by the number of different measurements. So standard signal processing trick used here. You get to do this because you get to, flip, you get to make 1,000 measurements a second, so why not? Right? You know, squeeze, uh, squeeze every inch out that you can. So here's uh, with uh, Walsh fun uh, functions, for example. You encode uh, the various mirrors. So here's uh, some data from Raymond spectrometry on various blood analytes. It's a little hard to read, but it's basically looking at the reference concentrations of different blood analytes and how well uh, they correlate to each other. And I'll show you here. Here's an animal experiment from a pig that was, uh, in this case, shocked with a large amount of glucose and then insulin. So you can see the, the glucose profile, actually the other way around, insulin and then glucose. The glucose profile going like this. So you're putting this animal through a shock, and at the same time, you're moving all of the other uh, uh, blood analytes um, hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, hematocrit, potassium, um, glucose, sodium, pH. Everything is moving because now you've shocked this pig. Uh, the other experiment they tried is to, to give. Uh, uh, bacteria and then an antibiotic mm -hmm. and then do that in various proportions. So the way they ran the experiment is they had two optical sensors, one affixed on the chest of the pig, the other one moving around, so completely non-invasive, which is the key here. And the second one is uh, a blood drawn, arterial blood drawn uh, at regular intervals and then a full blood panel done including blood gases. And this was done under you know, supervision of a, a, a number of medical experts. So here's some data for glucose, for example, here's the real glucose level uh, there, and then here's the measured glucose level optically, completely non-invasively, which is quite impressive on this part. Here's the second part, is sodium, like that. Here's hemoglobin. I'll stay with that. So you can see an, a, a number of different parameters that are really hard to measure otherwise, measured completely non-invasively with the mirror, uh, digital mirror rate. So the question is now, could you do this on the back of a watch and, and wear this and have the full chemometry system on this? So even if you could today, what would you do with it? <laughs> right? So the one problem is, how do you measure it? And there's a number of solutions to do that. The second problem, which I think might be interesting for you guys, is given that you have access to users through you know, your, your, your other parent company on an everyday basis, right? I, I hold a mouse for eight hours a day. right? <laughs> And I stare at a screen for eight hours. You can put a pulse oximeter in that mouse. You can put any kind of device you want in that and collect all of this information. And then in three years, tell me, look, something's wrong with your profile. Uh, something's changed. Go ahead. How many government bureaucracies will be hit if we do anything to do that called health care? Ah, yes. Excellent question. I'll answer that in two and a half slides. Um, here's the bilirubin metabolism that I talked about earlier. I won't even go through any of the details other than to say that even in this very complex metabolism, what happens is you get one CO molecule 
for every single bilirubin molecule that, that, that gets created. So measuring bilirubin, very hard to do. Right? Measuring CO gas, hard but not impossible. As a matter of fact, with the simple uh, and cheap, as I'll show you here, uh, miniaturized mass spectrometer, you get to measure this. And how do you take the sample? Do you have to actually breathe into some tube? Maybe, maybe not. Depending on what kind of accuracy you're looking for in the consumer application, you could have this mass spectrometer just there in front of you in a microphone, in, a, in, a, in your monitor. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at EEG information. You're looking at all of the blood analytes, all non-invasive. You're looking at uh, information exhaled in the breath that gives you full diagnostics of what's happening inside the body, right? Not full, but a large amount of diagnostic information. And how do you get to integrate this information and who gets to do it? Uh, right now, I'll tell you that the likelihood that the medical device companies will do this is virtually non-existent. So I think the, the future is in some consumer products company or a combination of consumer products companies uh, with sufficient research to collect and integrate this information and then make an everyday health index. Right? Uh, top of the head idea. Uh, carbon monoxide is not a good thing anyway. Now, you would certainly easier, more easily add this to a standard carbon monoxide detector than make it stand alone, right? That's right. You, you put something that detects bad carbon monoxide if it's bad and says run away from the building because you, you'll die, and a small amount said, hey, there's some Billy Rubin out there. That's right. But basically, if you just measure it every day, and all of a sudden it would tell you, look, for some reason, your red blood cells are dying a lot faster than they should be. Because that's the process of the, the breakdown of red blood cells. Mm -hmm. is, uh, the, the process of hemolysis generates CO gas. You don't even have to be very right. You don't even need to care how much CO gas you're producing every day on an absolute scale. You don't need to say, look, it's 6 ppm a day. Who cares? You used to produce this much, and now you produce this much. Go see somebody. So shifting the whole concept of healthcare from reactive healthcare to proactive healthcare. And it's up to, it's, I, eventually it's going to be up to the consumer to do that. Because we simply don't have enough doctors or enough medical device companies to undertake this problem. It's just, it's not possible in the current context. Can this be used as a guideline for uh, weight loss? Let's say if you confine yourself to blood sugar. Uh, there, there's a lot of information on the glycemic, glycemic index of a lot of food products. Sure. So can, but it's going to have different effects on everybody because everybody's metabolism is different. That's right. But what you care is... Before you start, you measure metabolism for seven days in a row in the morning when you first wake up. Then you start a program of exercise and diet and whatever, and you say, what's happening with my metabolism? Is it staying the same? Is it going up? I'm going to try this exercise for a week, then I'm going to try something else for a week. Which is better? Right? Which is going to give me the result that I'm looking for? Was that your question? Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking in terms of an application. So. <clears throat> That would be one. Actually, there, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an uh, interesting topic today. There is a small company in Philadelphia that makes a wearable uh, metabolic monitor. And they look at a number of simple things, but they integrate them over a long period of time. So they look at, um, and I forgot the name of the company, but they look at, um, they try to estimate metabolic rate by looking at the heart rate. They have a 3D accelerometer that just says how much you're moving during the day and they measure temperature, and a couple other very simple innocuous kinds of things in a wearable sensor. It goes like this. Now you can imagine that sensor shifting down to your hand, and you can imagine that all of us now have cell phones and iPods with 60 gigabytes of data. <laughs> you, know, uh, you, know, I have, uh, you know, 128 megabytes <laughs> right here, and you've seen the USB watches, right? I mean, this is, I don't need to convince you of this, but um, this device, the, the brain scope, has a flash card that plugs in in the back, and I can show you this when we're done. Um, four gigabyte flash card. And then you plug it in, then you put another one in. Right, so even if you had to lug something like this, it, you're, still think, you're still on the order of magnitude of something that's usable. But imagine putting this in your computer and having a means to collect and analyze this data and just tell you every day, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Now go see somebody. Now. Uh, to answer your question uh, here, and, uh, and I'll wrap it up in a couple of minutes. When is a medical device, when is a consumer product? First of all, I'm not an expert at this, so that's the first disclaimer. These are non-expert um, uh, observations. <coughs> uh, certainly not an expert in the regulatory field, and even less of an expert in the legal field and liability and all of that. So if, before you do anything, talk to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. But what I do know is 
that we, uh, as a medical device company, we're regulated by the FDA. And one of the um, key things that makes a difference is in a medical device, medical device, the kind that we make, are prescribed by a doctor and are used by a doctor. And the medical decision is made by a doctor. So if you look at what is not a medical device, one of the things that can help make the determination is, is it invasive or is it non-invasive? Are you putting energy into the patient? Right? So, so if you're sitting, it may be non-invasive, but it's a seven Tesla magnet. That's a medical device. Right? You wouldn't want to do that. If it's an ultrasound, that's a medical device. You're injecting energy into the patient. EEG, you're measuring uh, electrical activity. Uh, Non-invasive blood measurement, you're putting something close to the skin, right? Or touching the skin. You're not poking the skin and getting a blood sample out. And the most important part that I've learned about the FDA is that they want to know what claim are you making. If you say, here is your CO level. Right? And your device says your CO level is 5 ppm. Right? That's a very different thing than saying um, your bilirubin is high and now you have a problem. Or worse yet, your bilirubin is OK and no, you don't have a problem. Right? So, so there are a lot that I've, been, that I've learned over the years from lawyers who deal with uh, the FDA is to be very careful about what claims are being made. On this. And then insurance companies also look at this. I do know of a number of, of non-medical device companies they look at uh, like the polar heart rate monitor, uh, the metabolic rate. Um, Omron and two dozen other companies make the uh, tympanic ear thermometer where they uh, measure with infrared, measure the, the, uh, the temperature of the tympanic membrane. Uh, of course, you go to any Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS, one of these, and you'll see a whole host of devices that are non-prescription. You go in, you take them, you do with them whatever you want. Blood pressure, you know, heart rate, like that. So um, I, I personally feel that there is a, a mass market for consumer products that are based on medical device principles. So what I've done so far, with my career at least, is looked at areas where medical device, where devices were used in a confined, highly specific environment, like with a neurologist, in a neurologist office, in a big sound booth, and 20 electrodes. So that's the current state. And my job has been to move that so it's used by a nurse, it's a handheld device, one button, red and green light, and used on four million babies right, that are born in the US. So now, I think, for me anyway, the next interesting part is, now how do you move this a step further out so you're not at all in the medical environment, you're not dealing with somebody who is sick, or likely to be sick, but you're moving this out into uh, consumer products. And I outlined a number of different applications. And I think what stands between us and that is good signal processing, not good sensors, I think we have excellent sensors. Good signal processing and the ability to manage a large amount of data and then access to uh, a large number of people. And uh, that's, that's all I have. Questions, comments? Let me be devil's advocate. You claim Please. medical principles and selling consumer devices. Now, 25% of these consumers won't buckle their seat belts. And a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a comparable percentage still smoke cigarettes, right? 50 years after the numbers came out. You're going to sell them health this way. As a matter of fact, uh, our bilirubin device, one of the things we're looking at now, we call it bilirubin because that's how it was used, but it's a, uh, uh, we're looking at applications for smoking cessation. Because ah. if you get that feedback, you know, look at Weight Watchers. Mm. What does Weight Watchers really do for you? It helps you count points, and it gives you your own weight, right? which you can do at home. Yes. Uh, but people pay 30 bucks a month for this information. Okay. So uh, in smoking cessation, you'd like to, w when you actually see, this is how we tested these things. We have smokers and non-smokers. It's amazing. They'll go out and smoke a cigarette, and their CO level will go you know, from 6 ppm to 21, 22, 18, something like that. CO, this is a poisonous gas. Yeah. And, and you, once you see this every day, and you see what you're doing is, is, is helping, then it's information that, that, that you're bringing in. Why they don't do seat belts? Some people don't do seat belts. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just got a, a, um, an approval to do uh, testing in the ICU intensive care unit at NYU. And the people that we talked to there, they weren't really complaining in a traditional sense, but they were saying, you know, we don't, used to, we don't get as many head injuries here as we used to uh, because of uh, seat belts. First of all, they're in New York City, so there's never been any good uh, you know, um, heavy duty head injuries like you'd see in Cleveland or St. Louis or somewhere like that. Um, because you can't go that fast in New York, <laughs> even if you wanted to. 
The second part is they say that it's exactly the, the, the prevalence of seatbelt use and airbags that has had a dramatic practical influence uh, on this, together with use of helmets in, in, uh, in sports. And actually, so people do care about their health. And, and no, they care about the $86 ticket. Pardon me? They care about the $86 ticket for not wearing a seatbelt. That's right. So uh, <laughs> we can give them a discount on the next version of Windows. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Uh, in the EEG part of the talk, uh, have you come up with parametric or non-parametric signal models in order to remove NERS or classification? Um, we didn't look at modeling for that. Uh, we, we, that's not how we denoise the signals. Yeah, it's standard filtering. And, and then there's some ad hoc signal processing for removing artifacts. So eye movement is a big problem, uh, neck movement, any muscle movement. I, I, eye movement is a problem for a number of different ways, two of which are, uh, is one that eye itself is a dipole. And as you move this dipole, you're affecting right, uh, uh, the electrical field. The second one is muscles that move the eye horizontally and vertically affect the EEG. The good news is we can take out those artifacts automatically very well. And uh, we had uh, looked at, and uh, uh, there are a number of people who've done <coughs> independent component analysis on EEG data. One nice thing about um, EEG data, it's different from different electrodes until you have this big eye artifact. And then all of your, the entire set of, 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 of your uh, electrodes goes up and then comes back down. So ICA picks that up very nicely. You can just subtract it out. And the wavelet based approach was a lot superior uh, with respect to the conventional approach, right? That's what you showed yes. in one yeah. of the graphs. Now, so is that used... because of the wavelet transformation or is it because of the... It, it was a number of, number of uh, uh, tricks we used there. One of the things we used is the wavelet packet uh, algorithm and, and looked at uh, the wavelet packets applied to classification. So rather than optimizing the Rather than using entropy as a cost function, we use the separation of classes as a cost function. More questions? Yeah. Uh, so I have to say this is the second time that I have heard uh, Elvis talk, and I always feel depressed at the end of the talk because I always want to hear more. <laughs> and uh, it, it's very captivating. I'm very excited about uh, his work. And so please, let's thank uh, Elvis as a speaker. Thanks, Elvis.